Perfect. And we are officially recording. So hello, Melissa Orlov. How are you? I am doing well and I'm delighted to be here. Oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm genuinely very excited to talk to you. I've, I followed, as we talked before, but I followed your platform for a little while and I'm circling back to the topic of ADHD and I'm, I was just so excited that we connected and as I have it, I have a million questions and I always have to hone it down um, <laughs> because that's how my brain works. Um, so I just, I want to dive right in. So please, can you give us some background in who you are and how you came to this work? Well, so I am a marriage consultant and an author. Mm -hmm. I, um, I now actually do a lot of group um, educational things. I have a seminar for couples that I give multiple times a year by Zoom and I have non-ADHD support groups. And I do work with some couples as well on a sort of individual couple basis. But my area of expertise is how adult ADHD impacts relationships where either one or both partners has the ADHD. Right. Um, and, uh, and I have two award-winning books on the topic as well and a couple yeah. of other books that I've contributed to and et cetera. The, the first one is usually the best inter introduction. It's the ADHD effect on marriage. So that's a, been a bestseller and it's a, yeah. a good introduction to the topic. And actually we just added, I added that book to our um, book recommendations for this winter. So I've, I've gone through it and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all the things and we will get into that because I, I really do think it's it's a phenomenal text in terms of the foundation for what we're going to get into and what we're going to talk about, which is relationships and ADHD. So um, I think as a whole, I'll just speak to the fact that relationships for me are, are quality of life. I think mm -hmm. uh, for me, the, the definition of what makes, I guess, life not I don't, I don't know how to word this. For me, it's the quality of our relationships are very definitive of the happiness in, in our mm -hmm. lives. And I think whether that is intimacy, whether that is family, whether that is friendships, um, I think relationships are so important, regardless of, of any, any category. Now, within the ADHD realm, I think there's a lot of challenges that come forward. And I'll speak for myself, whether professionally and working with students, um, personally, my own my own partner, and then of course my family. Looking back, in terms of my childhood and what was some pretty intense situations or or moments that we sort of accepted as completely normal, and having the knowledge and awareness that I do now, it's like wow. Majority of my family, <laughs> we are now diagnosed ADHD. <laughs> so just it's it's a it's a funny circle and kind of come back around, but. Um, relationships are just, they're just so vital. So yeah. what I would love to connect first or ask you first is what are some common characteristics or traits that people have approached you with? Okay. Well, and before, I just want to agree with you, by the way, relationships are critically important. Um, yeah. You know, good, solid connections extend your life. Right. And loneliness yeah. shortens your life. So it's that important. Ned Hallowell likes to call uh, relationships the other vitamin C connection. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, which I think is great. Um, so, so one of the things, so ADHD, if you think about ADHD, it has specific symptoms that you have to have in order to be uh, evaluated as having ADHD. And so what that means is that those specific symptoms, particularly if you're not aware of the adult ADHD, which the majority of couples are not, right. um, then have very specific uh, other partner responses to them. So these patterns develop uh, in the relationship that come from not knowing about the ADHD, from misinterpretation of what the symptoms mean, um, from responding defensively or, you know, feeling hurt when in fact it's a symptom, not an intentional action, um, those kinds of things. And the patterns are very predictable. I mean, they're so predictable. I wrote uh, what I did not realize really at the time um, when I wrote my first book, it was based in part on my own um, story, my ex-husband now has uh, ADHD. I do not. Um, and um, people say, you know, what, were you a fly on the wall? How do you know this stuff? It's mm -hmm. because um, the, it's, the, it's so predictable, these patterns. Right. So, so for example, misinterpreting symptoms. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so if 80 to 90% of adults with ADHD have not yet been ad- officially diagnosed, that means most people are having the symptoms in their relationship and have no idea what's going on. It's very easy, therefore, to misinterpret the symptom. Absolutely. And, you know, if, if you're really highly distractible, for example, mm-hmm. uh, and you, you know, your partner experiences your distractibility as lack of interest, Absolutely. Yeah. And so you end up feeling lonely because you think you're part and, and confused because you think suddenly your partner isn't interested in you and you respond accordingly, right? You would respond in a very human way, right. which would be to try to get more attention and try to figure out what's wrong. You know, don't you love me anymore? Did I do something wrong? It becomes high tension. The ADHD partner doesn't realize what's going on because this is sort of the norm for them. For them, right. And, uh, and they respond poorly to sud- the sudden uh, questions and doubts. And, you know, of course, I love you. What are you talking about? Why are you coming after me? You know, why do you need so much attention? <laughs> All this stuff. And where is this coming from? Like yeah. two different worlds sometimes. And, yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. And so you get these, these sort of negatively reinforcing downward spirals in these relationships, which happily, once you actually understand the impact Mm-hmm. Um, you can really change how those interactions go. Um, right. And so that's why it's so important to understand that, you know, you've got recognizable, definable ADHD symptoms, human responses to those symptoms, patterns that result. And so if you interrupt those patterns, much can yes. change, which is great. Right. When my, I'll speak personally, when my partner and I first, this was many years ago, but when there was a first diagnosis, he was diagnosed with adult ADHD. And at the time, um, it was determined that like I did not have it and he did. So I feel like, and then we'll fast forward <laughs> 10 years later, but I feel like I, I, I've all been in two, the same relationship, but it feels like two different relationships, if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. there was before I knew I had it. And then there was the after that I now understand that I have it. So in the before, because mine resonates differently, or it shows up differently, I'm very much an organized person. I've always considered myself, you know, the type A. Um, and my husband's very much more distractible. Mm-hmm. So it was very much like that. We got the diagnosis. We, we, things started to become more clear. It, we were very much going through things like that, where in the beginning, our relationship was so wonderfully intense and we were so focused on one another. And then as life happens, responsibility and jobs, all that stuff, he was becoming more distractible. And I was like, what? Um, hello, like I'm over, and that was part of our arguing where it's like I was in the middle of a sentence and he would go off and do something. I'm literally in the middle of a sentence. And I remember thinking, is this like real? Like, hello? (laughs) Is this what marriage is about? (laughs) And and then he would look at me like, I'm, I'm crazy. He's like, oh yeah, sorry. What? And uh, five minutes went by and I'm still standing in the same spot. Like, (laughs) <laughs> and so it was it, the point is, is that we once we got the diagnosis and we had that understanding, it yeah. definitely felt it felt much better where it was like, oh, it wasn't so personal. It yeah. wasn't so it was all about the intention. Right. So it was very much that's not the intention. But having said that, there's also how do we deal with this? Because right. at, the, at the end of the day, is it intentional? No, of course not. And I now understand that as as the partner. But at that time, I'm like, but how do we how do you, we still get to a point where you are not walking away <laughs> when right. I am literally in the middle of a sentence? So I also think there's where we had to come to a place was accountability as well. So yes, yes. the diagnosis is is here. It's real. I'm starting to we're becoming more aware. But what do we do with this? Like, how do we proactively create strategies for me and for the other, the, the, the ADHD partner so that we are both sort of within our own feelings of, of self, of, of respect. Right. Yes. And also not only respect for each other, but also the ability to express yourselves as you are. Right. Absolutely. Um, and not just have to completely adjust everything to accommodate a different person. You know, we were talking about patterns and you talked about how amazing the courtship was. One of the patterns is Mm -hmm. what's called hyper-focused courtship. 
Absolutely. Which, yes. You know, it has to do with lots of extra dopamine, which is something yeah. that everybody gets, whether you have ADHD or don't have ADHD, everybody gets lots of extra dopamine when you meet somebody new and they're really yeah. interesting. Feels great. What happens when ADHD is on board is they get hyper-focused yes. on their partner. And it is so wonderful and mm -hmm. amazing 100%. Um, and exciting. And then for everybody, the dopamine goes away. That extra burst of dopamine goes away somewhere, they think, around 24 to 28 months into the relationship. When you get back um, and you're out of this 24 to 28 months, month period, um, right. things can change rather dramatically and quite quickly. And I remember sort of suddenly being very confused mm -hmm. by the fact that there seemed to be a different person in my yes. marriage. And um, it was so sort of a different person because I had never known my husband as the person who was the low dopamine person. I had only known him as the high dopamine person. So it was quite Absolutely. a surprise. And, um, and I was very confused and kind of hurt and wondering whether I had done something wrong or, you know, what was going on. And those are pretty common feelings that people have. So, you know, you were talking about mm -hmm. trying to figure out what do you do if your partner is walking away from you in the middle of a conversation. And those are the kinds yeah. of things that start to happen after that mm -hmm. extra dopamine goes away. It's a big <laughs> surprise. Um, and, and I think what you're trying to do is align Behaviors with intentions. Yes. So the walking away is part of the symptomatic behavior. It is distractibility. The ADHD brain is, is the thing that is most important to the ADHD brain is the thing that's new and interesting. Some people joke shiny. Um, we say shiny all the time. Yeah. Yep. This thing that comes in and engages <laughs> yep. in that moment. It's a very present moment. Mm -hmm. focused, very reward focused, yes, attention center in that brain. And so something intrudes and your partner goes, Oh, pfft, and off they go. Um, and it isn't personal at all. Yes. <laughs> um, but it still feels bad. Yes, so absolutely. It's not his intention to hurt you. So there is a learning process about the ADHD. And then also about the strategies that you use to better align the intentions you have with the behaviors, you know, sort of get control yes. of that attention seeking reward seeking mm -hmm. brain so that you can pay enough attention to your partner so that they understand that you care about them. Absolutely. And I also want to say this because this is where I felt very isolated at that time mm -hmm. because what was happening was, I, I couldn't, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't understand why I felt like my partner at that time was not paying so much attention to me. Like exactly what you had, had mentioned. Like I was left feeling very angry. Yes. Alone, isolated, which then obviously feeling that internally, I was not able to articulate that at, as well as I should have. Right. So but you then, behaved it. And I absolutely behaved it. And so again, he's approaching me like, what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not expressing myself. Well, you should know. Like, you know what I mean? And he really, he really doesn't know. And he's like, I don't know what, I don't know what you're talking about. And what, what started happening was anger, resentment, and it's building and it's building and it's building. And that there was a period for me for a while where I felt I wanted someone to talk to about it. I knew he had ADHD at this point. It's like, now I, I, I get it. I know it's not your fault, but I'm still left here with these feelings that I don't know what to do with. And I feel like that's where it's just so important to have those processes and those strategies because those feelings are so normal. And then I didn't want to make him feel bad because I know he's not trying to, but I still feel how I feel. So it's like, where do we, where do we go from here? So just really working that out, being so hyper aware and, and having that communication was, took us a long time. We're still working on that. I just, <laughs> just want to make it sound like it's not like all better. It's like, no, no, no. This was the early stages of like, okay, I'm not as angry because cool. Yeah. It's not totally your fault. But at the same time, you still are feels still bad. It's, I still feel like crap. So yeah. Yeah, this is kind of I just and I didn't have anywhere to release that. Right. So I just kind of bottled it and internalized it. And then it resonated and showed up sometimes in unhealthy ways. And, and it's just yeah. really, I think, important to address it now. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, so the first steps of this process mm -hmm. are um, first educational. I mean, everybody always says that. Well, first thing you have to do is learn. But actually, in this case, you really do, because there is all this misunderstanding and yeah. also a sense like you don't know other people who are going through this necessarily. And so right. it, it's sort of isolating. Yes. And what you realize is you go through and you hear all these other people talking about it or, you know, read my books or whatever it is. Absolutely. Um, that you suddenly go, oh, wait, this is a thing. This isn't actually my partner or me. This is the fact that there's a third party in mm -hmm. our relationship, which is this ADHD. And the other thing that's really important is that both partners acknowledge and own that it is there. And it's not just the ADHD, but also the responses to the ADHD. So in that interaction where you were feeling hurt, and yeah. you were becoming angry, you would be expressing that anger typically back to your partner, who then mm. is being attacked in essence, and right. will start to feel defensive and hurt himself, and yes. then respond poorly to you. And that's not what you need. So then you respond even more poorly, you know, so, so the cycles. responses become very important as well. So if both partners are able to say, hey, ADHD actually is a real B mm -hmm. needs to be managed. C, we need to get ourselves educated here. Yeah. That's a really good start. Mm -hmm. And then you can learn the strategies. You can be much more um, graceful right. about yes. how you interpret these behaviors. Also mm -hmm. recognizing that, you know, just because it's part of ADHD doesn't mean it can keep going on, right? There are certain things that are part of a healthy relationship that whether or not you have ADHD, you need to strive to um, contribute. Likewise, whether or not your partner has ADHD, you need to strive to, con to, to uh, contribute respectful responses, and et cetera. Express your anger. Anger is fine. Anger is not the problem. It's how you express the anger right. um, that really becomes the issue. We, uh, you said shiny, so we call it shiny squirrel. Shiny squirrel. <laughs> And it's like, and it, if we're in a moment and now it's for both of us, but if we're in a moment and, or we're veering off, like, and, and it's funny because now it's my whole family, like my mom, my sister. So it's like shiny squirrel. And we're just like, Oh, sorry. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like a person in a room. Like I, I say that very legit. It's taken a long time to get here, but it, it's called, we call it shiny squirrel. I imagine anyway. a metallic balloon floating around I, in the room, you know, a shiny like, squirrel balloon. <laughs> Oh, yes. So, uh, so many stories I won't get into. But <laughs> yes. So now fast forward, you know, 10 years um, down the road. So now I'm in a position, same relationship. Although, again, sometimes it feels like it's a different relationship because um, I've been diagnosed with ADHD, which was also one of those things where there was a relief in it. Mm -hmm. um, but also it was I had a lot of denial because for so long we've definitely we've played up to our parts. So my husband's the, like I said, more the more disorganized, but incredibly articulate and funny and charming. And, um, but then there's, there's me who's more like strategic and organized and we sort of play on those roles. And I remember we were in, um, we were with our counselor and my counselor turned around and looked like right at me. I was like, you know, you have ADHD, right? <laughs> and I remember being like, I do not. And I'm like, no, I don't, but thank you. And again, as an educator, I work with like, I'm very well versed in what this is at this point a few years ago. And I'm like, no, I'm not, but thank you. And then she started naming off things and characteristics and things she's noticed. And then my husband just kind of looked at me and I just, I burst, like, I don't know what it was about that moment. And I burst into tears because there was this weird relief for myself because I felt like I'd been holding on to so much and I was like, oh, my God, like, I think I think that actually makes sense. It's just it shows up so differently for me than it does my my partner. And so yeah. now we're in that position where we're both ADHD. And then it's like, well, I feel like I should be so aware and know what I'm doing. And I don't I have no idea what I do with this. I'm like, oh, my goodness. What, where do we go from here? So when two people have ADHD, um, characteristics and traits and strategies that you've come across that sort of show up for couples? Well, you know, as you point out, um, while there are set type numbers of symptoms, people show up quite differently with ADHD, yeah. depending upon in part what their coping strategies are and what their emotional um, 
set points are. So a lot of people with ADHD, for example, carry around a lot of shame yes. and are easily emotionally triggered as a result. Um, and so that emotional instability is one sort of subset of people with ADHD. Other people are just completely and totally disorganized, can't manage to finish a project if their life depends on it, you know, right. have trouble remembering things. That's a different different form of, of ADHD. There's your form, which sounds like one of your coping strategies has been to be hyper-organized. Yeah. You know, the list makers and the people who say my life will blow apart if I don't stay hyper organized. Mm -hmm. And you become actually very drawn to and reliant upon mm -hmm. um, that organization so that if somebody's upsetting your schedule, it, it ups, it's very upsetting to you because it, it puts that uh, control of the chaos at risk. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of different ways that um, that it shows up. So. It's, it's really about how the symptoms, how your specific set of symptoms shows up for you, becoming aware of what it is, and then mm -hmm. picking the strategies that match those symptoms. So mm -hmm. for okay. example, and this is true of treatments as well, a treatment or management uh, in treatments are also based in that thing. There's not one medication or one type of treatment that go that works for ADHD. Some people need emo, you know medications that help with emotional regulation. Some people need uh, medications that help with uh, focus. Some people need um, medications that help with um, you know sort of uh, general like depression and anxiety issues that come along with ADHD. And some people can't take medications at all, and they're doing a lot of other stuff. When you manage it, it's a whole uh, variety of things that you do, like exercise and sleep management and right. maybe medication and whatever, and behavioral strategies and interactive strategies, all this stuff. Same thing with the behavioral strategies. Like if you have, uh, well, tell me one of the symptoms that you are interested in managing, and I'll tell you a slew of things that people would use to work on that. Um, I have to have things tidied. So mm -hmm. to, to a point where we tried like little exercises, <laughs> like if my counter was messy and I had to go to bed, let's just say it was late and it was time to go to bed. It was time to shut down. And I would lie in bed thinking about my counter. <laughs> I would not sleep. And I'm just, and like, I would lie there. I, I tried. I'm like, nope. So I would yeah. go downstairs. It didn't matter if it was two in the morning. And I'm like, I have to clean it like it's literally it's become and not that I'm saying this is like necessarily overly positive but I just recognize that about myself that if I'm in a toy room with my children in our toy room then it takes everything in me <laughs> to sit with my children and just play yeah and that's and that's a, a real thing I'm working on where it's like I'm not going to get up and I'm, I'm not going to tidy as we play because I was doing that for a while. And yeah. I'm the fun mom because I'm tidying <laughs> as we're playing. And my kids are like, I wasn't done with the, like, I wasn't done. And I'm like, mom, oh, give me back like, my bear. Like, is it, and I'm like, oh, we're not. Oh, okay. So like, I'd have to take it back out and then I'm staring at it. And I'm like, yeah. oh, this is a problem. I, and again, now it's like, this is a problem. Like I, I need to address it. There's a time and a place to do, to do things. And it, it should not be disrupting. Yeah. Me, me playing with my kids on a Saturday afternoon, like, like type of thing. So that's yeah. something that I'm working on. <laughs> so it's, it's conceivable that there's an emotional component to that, that has to mm -hmm. do with anxiety or something like that. In which Absolutely. case there might be some, what I call leg one treatments that help with managing the anxiety better. That mm -hmm. could be, uh, and those are things that change how your brain functions actually. So that could be meditation. Yes. To get you to be more relaxed. It could be deep breathing exercises while you're in with your kids, you know, just Absolutely. to remind yourself, hey, I need to relax my body here a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. It could, you know, maybe there's a medicinal thing if it's really severe. Um, probably a, a good strategy for you would be cognitive behavioral therapy, where you work. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a form of therapy where you take the stories that you tell yourself, like, I will not be able to fall asleep unless I get, uh, you know, unless I get everything completely neat or, or mm -hmm. if my life will blow apart, if everything isn't just right. Right. And you start to push back against those stories and learn sort of where they come from and replace them with more productive and healthier stories. So that's another, and cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy has been shown in research to be quite effective 
for um, adults with ADHD um, for a variety of things. So it's possible that that would be it. Another thing that you could do, a couple of things that are just tactical, is that you could have your cleanup stuff be in like clear bas plastic bins or something, which is a very mm. uh, common um, ADHD uh, cleanup strategy um, for people who are less organized than you. Um, but you could turn it into a game so that part of your play with your kids is, you know, doing the basketball shots into the bins right. at the end of the game um, and um, and actually make it part of the play so that yeah. you don't have to think, oh, this might not get done because I might run into dinner or something else because it's so easy. You don't have to be uh, nitpicky about whether you put it into a drawer or bookshelf or whatever. You know, you've right. got these bins and you're just tossing stuff in. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another possibility um, yeah. that you could, you know, so there are things like that that right. you can do. And there are literally, there's almost a limitless number of the behavioral yeah. strategies that people can try. Um, and, uh, it, but also, uh, it's very important also to have these things that work on how your brain functions. So right. the meditation, the deep breathing, the CBT um, kinds of yeah. things would be the kinds of things that would align with that thing. So, so part of learning how to manage ADHD is understanding what are your target symptoms or what are the things that you feel are most important to work on, right? You only right. want to work on one or two things max at a time. Yes. That's important. And, yes. Yeah. And <laughs> yes. then otherwise, you know, you're doing 10 things, you can't do any of them well. Um, and then select maybe with the help of an expert or maybe with research or, or just creative thinking or whatever strategies that are known to work, to be ADHD friendly, to work with those specific issues. Right. Um, and, and so the strategies change pretty dramatically based upon what your specific symptoms are. And I will also say too, that I, I think I should bring up for those listening that are feeling it, that what we discovered part, a lot of our, of our tension between my husband and I was the triggers. So for example, as someone with ADHD that has to have things a certain way, and then as someone who's disorganized, we would like the play off of each other, yeah. right? So for me, I'm taking it so personally because it's so important. And for him, it's just something that he struggles with and is not necessarily thinking about it to the same level that I am. So, or at all. Or, or at all. That is also true, <laughs> Melissa. I exactly say it. You're right. <laughs> at all. Um, and that was also and still continues to be um, a a process for us, yeah. but we've had to actually really hone in on it. And when you were talking about selecting what you're going to focus on, so that's sort of become what we've zoned in on. This room can be messy. Like it, one strategy we've done, it's like I've had to relinquish control on a certain room where it's like, okay, you are allowed <laughs> to take control of this room and I am not allowed to say anything. Yeah. Like, I think the kitchen, for example, is my land. So well, it kind of thing. Real, yeah, that's a great strategy. So that's called silos. In oh, this okay. case, the silos are the rooms themselves, the geographic yes. spaces, but you can yes. also have silos with specific tasks where you right. do, you're in charge of a task from beginning to end. And so that's the idea of a silo. It's contained. Um, Yep. But um, that's a great strategy because I, I like to joke, but, you know, who made me queen, right? Why do I get to decide how what the house is going to look like? You live here, too, and it's your house. And so, you know, you shouldn't have anything to say over your partner's office or your partner's uh, cave or, or garage space yep. or whatever, car. And I'm, I'm laughing because that, that also took time for us, Melissa, where it was uh -huh. kind of like in, in a session, he's like, I live here, too. Like, do I get a room? And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess. Like, <laughs> that was also of like, you should. Like, you should get a space. Like, this is your house too. And you want the same type of feelings there's, of you know, relax when you get there's home, There's a right? gender thing. There's a gender yeah. and role thing, which is partially societal, where a lot of women think, hey, it's my house and I care and you don't care. And the reality <laughs> is actually because it has to do with how much autonomy you have, Mm -hmm. Even though you might not care whether the sofa is blue or brown, 
you might care that you have a space that's really your own, that your partner right. isn't constantly tidying up, you know, yeah. putting your glasses on the shelf when you don't want them there or whatever they are, you know. Because then he can't uh, find them. We had that fight too, where it's yeah. like, my glasses were here. I'm like, yeah, but they don't belong here. And then it was kind of like, like but they're my this, glasses, but they're my glasses. And I put them there. So I always remember where they are. Yeah. And then that became an argument because it's like, yeah, but they don't belong there. But see, that's, but see there in that case, you're in the wrong on that one. Sorry. Absolutely. But yes. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah that, no. Yes. And, and by the way, so one of the ADHD strategies mm -hmm. is this, what I call the stumble upon strategy. Mm -hmm. which is you put them in a place where you know you're going to stumble upon them at the right time or you're going to find them. So leave them on yes. your desk or you leave them on the kitchen counter or whatever it is so that when you need to read the book at your kitchen table, you can do it. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, there are, and part of having a dual ADHD couple mm -hmm. is that each of you has coping strategies which help you keep your world from falling apart. And they might be just like what you were describing in conflict. So just like a, what I call a mixed couple where one person doesn't have ADHD, you really do have to figure out, hey, you know what, let's back up here. What is actually fair? It is your house. It is my house. Okay. But I also have this really sort of deep seated need to organize, but you know, but yes. I don't have that need. Like, you know, let's, so, so you really, there's a lot of negotiation that goes mm -hmm. on here. And part of what you were describing. So you're talking, we were talking earlier about patterns. Yeah. There's a pattern which is really pernicious in it. And it is in almost every single couple that I have ever worked with. Okay. Um, that uh, is, is called what I call parent child dynamics, where the more organized person right. becomes the household manager. And unfortunately, usually also starts to try to manage the other partner. Right. Um, you know, you should do this, you need to work on this chore. Uh, why haven't you done that? Uh, you know, sort of a, a, a over functioning is really what it is in the relationship. Right. And the under functioning uh, other partner loses status and importance and um, interest, quite frankly, um, mm -hmm. in the relationship. I don't know if you guys have experienced that or not. Different stages, different times, I think mm -hmm. so. And like I said, the therapy has helped in terms of an, uh, an equal ground to kind of voice our, our feelings, right? So we come to that and have the opportunity to say how we feel. And that has been, that has been a very, a very huge lifeline. Yeah. And sort of having that sort of neutral ground and a person there to just say, Kate, your turn, Kate, your turn. And just sort of let that out because of that, because I feel I have felt at times used like that feeling of being used because I overmanage because I feel like I have to because right. it has to get done and we have all this responsibility. Whereas, you know, I think my partner has very much felt less important. And why would I bother if you're going to do it anyway? Or if I do it, you're just going to say it, you know, wasn't done the way it should have been done. So right. it's this cycle of, well, that's not my intention. And then, you know, his is, that's not my intention either. So right. we kind yeah. of spiral, right? And, and, and that forth. is classic parent child, what you're describing. Yeah. Um, where, you know, and, and you sort of box out the parent figure, the more organized figure boxes out in lots of ways, the person who is less organized and they have trouble contributing. Mm -hmm. And when they do contribute, they get critiqued <laughs> to your, yeah. to your husband's point. Um, and it's a really negative experience. Every couple that is actually going to make it who has ADHD in the relationship has to tackle this pattern and get yeah. out of it. And it's, it's really hard sometimes because you do have to learn mm -hmm. ways to accommodate, you know, he has to accommodate your hyper organization. Yeah. And you need to accommodate his less organized, his interest, less lowered interest in being organized or his having trouble following through on things or whatever. And yeah. then each of you, just like you say, you're working on not being so organized, not picking up the toys while you're still playing with them and et cetera. Yeah. Um, you have to work on your stuff and he has to work on his stuff. So it's not just like, okay, well, let's just accommodate each other. And somehow it's going to magically work out. That's not what happens. Right. Each person has to identify what they're contributing. That's a problem. Work on it and then figure out how do you meet? Where am I? There I am. How do you meet in the middle? <laughs> I knew right. my hands were somewhere. <laughs> um, how do you meet more in the middle? You're not, you're not going to be like each other. No. Right. Um, but, uh, but there are ways to, you know, figure out, well, 
this thing is really important to me. So we're going to try to make sure I get this. And that thing is really important to you, like autonomy or status or whatever it is. We're going to make sure you get that yep. and, and, um, and work that way. And actually, this is a, a beautiful segue to my next topic that I, I wanted to talk to you about, which is emotional dysregulation. Mm -hmm. So we, even within our strategies, we've come across within your book as well. Um, I'm going to identify three things that have been incredibly important, life-changing, and work in progress. <laughs> so for us anyway, and I can only speak from my experience in my own relationship, as well as friendships and mm -hmm. other dynamics of which I'm I'm very accustomed to. So for us, and I even wrote them down because I, I didn't want to forget them, and it was empathy, boundaries, and communication. Mm -hmm. So those are three things that we've really had to have conversations around and situations where we've been honest and open about the idea of empathy and really trying to understand the other person's perspectives and feelings. Um, communication, very clear communication. The other person does not know how I feel, despite the fact that I think that he or she should. Uh, they really don't. <laughs> Right. And that has been, that's been a lot for me to try and understand because I'm a feeler. Like I feel things intensely and a lot, but I don't realize that I'm not communicating in the way that I think I am. Um, yeah. And, and boundaries, boundaries have been a big deal in terms of setting them for, for both parties so that we always feel that we come to the table with mutual respect and we walk away feeling whole and intact and heard. Right. Um, so that's been something that we've deliberately, purposefully identified and constantly come back to. And it's hard. Like, it's not something that, oh, we identified it. So it's, it's done. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Then we had kids and then we had the job. Like, it's like, no, no, this is just, it's an ongoing thing, but, um, and it'll show up differently for everyone. But those three things have been something that we've both had to, and continue to have to really prioritize for yeah. for both of us well let me jump in a little bit on the communication side of things when mm -hmm. you were talking about you know this idea that my partner ought to be able to read my mind even you know i remember a conversation that i had uh, at one point with my ex where i where you know i'm also a feeler this is why mm -hmm. i do what i do yeah. uh and um and it's easy to expect that your partner thinks in the same way or values the same kind of the same patterns of thinking. And I remember having a conversation at one point, just sort of light conversation, like, well, so what makes you happy? And his response is, gee, I don't know. I never think about that. And mm -hmm. it really blew me away because I was thinking like, how is it possible to not think about that, that particular topic? But, uh, but he just had a very different way of approaching what it was he thought about, what he engaged with, what he looked at, whatever. So anytime mm -hmm. I overlaid or made any assumptions about what he might be thinking about right. um, or how he might be thinking about it or what he might be taking in as information as we're conversing with each other, I was right. almost always wrong. Yes. And so it's really important to be curious about what's going on for your partner. And if you say, you know, so what are you feeling right now? Which is a, you know, the thing that people who do counseling always are like, how are you feeling right now? <laughs> if your partner says, mm, I don't really know, or I'm not sure or whatever, it, that's actually what they mean. Like, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going in that direction. You really yeah. have to be thinking carefully about your partner. You can't read your partner's mind. They can't read your mind. You have to be clear. Yeah. And you also have to be respectful of the fact that they probably don't think like you and that's mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Um, Absolutely. It's a hard lesson to learn. We all have this idea that the world works the way it works for us, that yes. it works that way for everybody else. And then kids have been introduced, our two beautiful children, and there is nothing better or there's no greater highlighter <laughs> for your flaws and your challenges than children that definitely it's kind of bring forward that, right? Because they echo and they mirror. And um, prior to the pandemic, you know, like in terms of dysregulation and, and emotional 
chaos that can can ensue and intensify was just mornings, like getting my kids ready and out the door. You know, again, we got a certain time, pack lunches. Okay, does everybody have everything that they need? Do I have what I need? It was just, it was always, I dreaded mornings because it was so intense. Well, and, and so also chaotic, just, right? Oh. You're, when you're controlling your own environment, you're in mm -hmm. control. When yeah. you got a couple of youngsters around mm -hmm. who aren't, you know, who probably because ADHD is hereditary, maybe they have ADHD, maybe they yeah. don't, but no matter they're little and they yeah. don't have a lot of executive function at no. that age. So they're just like, wah, everywhere. Yep. And so that's got to be a real push on your yes. particular mm -hmm. uh, way of doing things. And so that, you you know, adjust, you have to adjust to it. You don't have a choice. You and I have to teach railroad them. I have to it. teach them to do better. Like, so when the pandemic hit, well, lockdown number one, um, there are many, but the first one, it was such a slower pace that I was like, wow, like how the mornings could go, kind of like mm -hmm. how it felt. And then when we went back the first the, the first time, I felt the difference, like, oh, and now I'm back to that rushed feeling. And it was it was a very much okay. Like this is something I have to I have to get in front of this because now yeah. they're gonna start mirroring me. And yeah, you don't want them to be frantic or upset. And I, or yeah, anxious absolutely. Or any of that. Well, you know, there's an opportunity with all of this for a lot of creative observation and thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it, something as simple, for example, as putting clothes out the night before so that you have more time to do it, um, mm -hmm. you know, make a habit of the, everybody looks at what the weather forecast is, says for tomorrow. And then you yeah. say, OK, so that's cold. So let's put out a sweater or whatever it is. Um, the, things like that can simplify or or having some kind of a, a you know, the bag is out. The bread yep. is out. The only thing you have to get is the jelly or the peanut Absolutely. butter or whatever it is. Um, I guess you're not allowed to take peanut butter to school anymore. But <laughs> No, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> that's not showing my age. Um. <laughs> it's okay. I had, hey, I had Nutella lunches and those aren't allowed either. So yeah, when yeah. I was a kid. <laughs> there you go. They're not allowed. So, so there are creative ways. You know, you talk about having to teach your kids, but there are different ways to teach the kids. One is creative problem solving. And another right. is to say, you must do it this way. Right. Kids who have ADHD don't respond very well to you must do it this way. And quite frankly, young kids don't in general. In general, um, yes. <laughs> but particularly if there's a possibility that there's ADHD on board, which there is, if if you guys both have ADHD, yeah. it's pretty likely that there's some ADHD somewhere in the children. Yep. Um, uh, then you have to be particularly careful mm -hmm. about um, not building in um, shame triggers and embarrassment. I didn't do that right. Uh, all those kinds of things. Cause those are the demons that adults with ADHD have bring with them from childhood. The, the, right. one of the biggest emotional dysregulators actually is shame yes, and fear of disappointing other people. And they learn people who have ADHD and most of today's adults were not diagnosed. So they didn't know they had it. Um, they got no accommodations. They struggled through school, many of them, not everybody. Um, and uh, you don't want to do that to your kids. That's one of the yeah. benefits now of being in this new age where, mm -hmm. where we know about ADHD. And a, a big thing that we are, my husband and I are both tr so conscious of is how we self-talk. So mm -hmm. when I exactly, like, when we say things like, oh, like, I'm so stupid or like you say it without even meaning to. And that has really been something that I'm very proud to say, honestly, that we are very cognizant of. No, like we do not say things like that. And like, we don't say stupid. There's certain words we don't say in the house. Like we never right. say stupid. We, we make sure certain things in terms of negative talk and my children, it's all about how do you fill your bucket or how do you fill someone's bucket yeah. or it's called bucket dipping. So when you say something negative about yourself or someone, it's like, mommy, that's a bucket dipping. I'm like, Oh, sorry. <laughs> like, sorry. Like, it's just things like, or like I put on a shirt. I'm like, Oh, like, and I, and I forget she's there or I don't realize she's there. I'm like, Oh, I hate this shirt. Like, Oh my God, look at, and my, my daughter will, will address it like yeah. mommy. And so things like that, that I I'm trying, we're trying so hard to be very aware of because of that internal dialogue that, that they will carry with them. Yeah. Um, they're going to get it at school from coaches, absolutely. from friends. Uh, I was horrified. Um, my kids are now around age 30. And I was horrified um, when they were in high school that one of the sort of common comments 
for people sort of a diss is, uh, you know, oh, that's so ADHD. And I was right. like, oh, I hate that. <laughs> that's yeah. what's in the lexicon. Um, and yeah. they, they say, oh, mom, you know, it's not a bad thing. But I'm like, yeah, but if you had ADHD, it would feel like a bad thing if when somebody did something that was a little bit crazy or, you know, could have been done better if that was what was said about somebody else or them or whatever, you know, right. it, it's not meant to hurt, but it, it can, it can. There's a lot of those that those kids will go through, unfortunately. Now, what people need to know is, well, so many things about you and your work because it's amazing. So first thing is how do people get a hold of you? And then I would love it if you could um, talk about the workshops that are coming up that people can sign up, couples can sign up for as well. So the best way to get hold of me is at my website, which is ADHDmarriage.com. And uh, I do have a contact form there and I try really hard to respond to everybody um, mm -hmm. or get them the information that they need. I admit that sometimes one of my associates helps out, but cause I get a lot of email, but mm -hmm. I do try to respond to everybody. I do also have this seminar that I give uh, three times a year at the moment. It's eight weeks long. Um, it's mm -hmm. given by zoom um, two hours a week. So it's, you know, it's pretty intense, but it is uh, it's a, it's a lecture plus a live Q and a plus written Q and A's mm -hmm. plus articles and homework and stuff. So uh, it's really good. I've been giving it for a very long time now and have really honed it. And a lot of couples really like it. Um, I give non ADHD support groups to help right. people figure out strategies and work through some of the complicated feelings that they have about their relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have an, an ADHD partner, um, a working group that I don't run, but somebody runs for me. We've developed a program together. Um, I have a lot of information. There's a mm -hmm. free uh, treatment, how to optimize treatment for adult ADHD ebook on my homepage. So there's a ton of stuff at my website and I'm happy to have anybody come and explore it. Um, and then wow. of course there are my books. So yes. yeah. Well, I thank you so very much. And I will put all the links um, in the descriptions below, but I thank you so much for your time. And this was amazing. And I know that anyone that connects with you will it will be what they need. That's, that's for sure. I believe things happen for a reason. I do. And I, and I, I gravitated towards your platform and, and it was amazing. So thank you so much for, for chatting with me today. Well, thank you.